Good morning, good morning, good morning. Derek Watson here, the angry dentist. Oh God. Two blokes shouting at each other. They know each other. Well, it's a wet day in paradise, which is not so bad. We haven't had much rain lately. So it's been raining all night by the look of it. It's very wet. Oh, I'm gonna put my lights on. Oh, I've got my lights on. I have to remember, because my other car puts the lights on automatically. And this one doesn't, so. We're in a transitional period with the lighting on the cars. So anyway, where was I yesterday? I was talking about the association, wasn't I? The GDPA, the one that sort of went from uh, 1954 to about for about 50 years. I think we had our 50th anniversary, but but just to recap, I mean the the problem was that um, the, all the associations other than the BDA were sort of tended to get marginalised, uh, and it didn't help that um, the chief dental officers tended to be uh, sort of BDA appointees, by which I mean they are appointed from the upper echelons of the BDA, you know. And there was never any love lost between the BDA and the GDPA. So, um, you know, I'm a bit, Margaret Seward was uh, uh, editor of the British Dental Journal, etc. And, uh, but, you know, b b sort of old school, lovely sort of person, very charming and, and like willing to talk to anybody, you know, and willing to be seen with everybody and never, you know, didn't have a malicious bone in her body and would, uh, and she was re replaced by Barry Cockcroft, who I was on the British Dental Association General Dental Services Committee with, so I knew him uh, from beforehand. Unremarkable bloke, I've got to say, I still haven't quite, I mean, I, I've got my suspicions about how people do get appointed to the post of Chief Dental Officer. I think that the Department of Health has a sort of a, a strategy or a, what's the word, a sort of a, a general policy thrust and when, when they interview, they sort of pick people who are in part of that team, you know, who are sort of quite uh, amenable to either, I, I wouldn't, I think Barry was, how can I put it? Because I want to be I want to be fair to him, because everyone thinks that there's a sort of a lot of animosity between me and Barry. And I don't think, I don't think he's a bad person. I, I, was he a selfish person? Yes. Was he a greedy person? Yes. Uh, has he got a low IQ? Yes. But uh, bad? I don't know <laughs> I could say he's bad. What was bad for the association was that he was chosen as, uh, for, for the GDPA, was that he was chosen from the BDA. And therefore, he came into the office with this conviction that uh, really the government should only talk to the BDA. And, and he was suddenly given the tools to make that a reality. And so, um, you know, and that greatly disadvantaged the, the GDPA and basically greatly advantaged the BDA. Um, so, and that coupled with this, as I say, the sort of general apathy amongst the dentists that, you know, thinking that a Facebook like was going to change the world, um, meant, that, um, meant that the GDPA was on the wane. So, what we did was we, we looked at our uh, strengths and, uh, you know, uh, the fact that now how could we differentiate ourselves from the BDA? And one of the things, or the main thing, was that we were um, more focused on terms and conditions and they were more uh, the clinical and the social. But then they, they were given the terms and conditions to negotiate as well. Although we did go along to the review body But they tended, um, you know, they, they sort of, <laughs> they sort of been talking to the doctors' representatives, the British Medical Journal, uh, you know, the B, the BMA, and then then they would talk to the BDA and get into the weeds on the stats and everything, and then and then and they would like, oh well, you know, it's time for a break. Let's have a quick chat with the GDPA, and which was a shame because I think again we had far more intellectual rigor than they did, and uh, and and vastly more experience about what would work and what wouldn't work in general practice and uh, but again we didn't get taken seriously or as seriously as we should have been I mean I, I mean they treated us with respect but they came up with these ridiculous uh, formulas like uh, 
income minus expenses equals uh, net profit and said oh, we're, we're working on the basis of this formula what do you think about it <laughs> and it's you know and it, it was like those formulas that you see in the newspapers for, uh, some scientist has come up with an equation to make the best hamburger you know and we're like you know this is just populist science uh, anyway so um, the long and the short of it was well, the GDPA was sort of withering on the vine uh, after 50 years and but we, we had a way forward um, and the, the way forward was to this sort of dichotomous sell the member benefits and uh, do the and still continue to do the lobbying on terms and conditions uh, but you know with the profit that that brought in but then again at exactly the wrong moment the market sort of fragmented so whereas we um, you know we provided the standard sort of associate contract um, then code started providing the associate contract and we one other area that we could have gone into was inspection and compliance and testing and uh, along comes the dental buying group and they start specializing in that so and the problem is that you know if you're going to try and get into these things then you end up doing all of them sort of badly whereas your competitors are just doing one of them really well and they don't want to subcontract to you for these services and give you part of the money they would obviously far rather keep the money themselves so so we were under attack from all fronts we were sort of locked out of uh, negotiations we were uh, not making any money on the uh, lobbying and all of the income producing arms were being gobbled up by these newly set up specialist companies but having said that, you know, I mean, the GDPA is infinitely scalable. I mean, it's scaled up from one person and theoretically it could scale down to one. Um, so, uh, you know, you just cut your suit to uh, tailor, you know, you tailor your suit according to the cloth, don't you? It's the same goes. So what we did was we tried to um, sort of rebrand and uh, we were the first association to include to, to go multi uh, disciplinary in other words to open the membership to nurses and hygienists and things like that because at the time nurses were coming on the register and uh, they had their own association but the nurses association suffered from the same problems that the GDPA had which was that the British Dental Association negotiated on their behalf which was odd really because I mean they, their membership was far higher than the British Dental Association and they didn't ask or want the BDA to negotiate on their behalf. They were more than capable of uh, going into the government and uh, talking about nurses' wages and terms, conditions and pensions and things like that. But but they suffered the same fate as us. They they literally got suffocated by by the sort of BDA, Department of Health, uh, axis of evil. And um, but you know it occurred to me and those of us around the council at the time that um, you know we, we were all having staff meetings at work and sitting down and solving the problems within the practice on a weekly basis or a fortnightly basis at a staff meeting a round table meeting and um, and yet at a national level nobody was talking to anybody so uh, we set up a few meetings of all the chief executive officers of all the associations including the technicians and uh, you know absolutely everybody and and they were reasonably successful but again the British Dental Association refused to attend and uh, sort of strangled everything so but um, that for a while that was quite successful because and there was no reason why we shouldn't have a round table approach and all the uh, DCPs who joined were Know, we're all very welcome and free and, and had benefits according to you know what their needs were etc and, and free to have a stand for election to the council etc etc so anyway that's I mean you know in a way that's a bit of a sad story because it does um, I mean on the other side of course there were other, you know there was a lot of social media activity going on there was um, uh, people organising through Facebook groups and stuff like that. So you know, and these, and these, uh, you know, you, you set up a, you could set up a Facebook group and get sort of six thousand young dentists and 
nurses and everything on it and and these numbers were sort of you know just unbelievable to those of us who are sort of struggling to attract new members at all that you could just set up a Facebook group and then all of a sudden you've got 6,000 followers but what did they you know what did they mean you know they, they didn't mean anything it just having 6,000 people press follow button in the real world doesn't achieve anything it really doesn't it's just you know it's just a way of sharing I suppose a bit of news and a few funny stories and that it's again it's a social thing it's not really a, what I call activism in other words that it sort of it changes anything you know the world just carries on as other people intend it to uh, if all you are prepared to do is, is click like or join a Facebook group so so anyway um, so what, what we're doing at that point is sort of producing a magazine which is taking a lot of is sucking sort of several thousand pounds out of the association ten months of the year and several more thousand pounds in terms of having to uh, source the material, write the material, typeset the material, deal with the printers and most of all uh, pack, it, pack it all up and post it all, you know. Um, and then along comes uh, Paul Mendelssohn from Code with a proposal for the GDPA Council, the DPA Council as they were at the time, that um, what he would do is he would uh, take over the association, sell a bunch of, you know, solve this problem of selling benefits to the members, sell a load of benefits to the members and um, add value to the association, you know, greatly add value to the association to the point where it might be worth two, three or even four million pounds as a saleable asset but there were sort of a few caveats one was that he would be in charge another one was that uh, as a mutual it wasn't really saleable because it belonged to the members and therefore it would need to be converted into some sort of entity that could be sold like a limited company and um, And, and that sort of massive, massive fat worm that was dangled because the, the deal was that the existing council members would become the directors of the new limited company. And, you know, it, it wasn't, it didn't take them long to divide four million pounds by ten and decide how much they would all get if the association was sold for four million pounds as a limited company and they were the 10 directors. So this proposal from Code and Paul Mendelssohn got, got a lot of support. <laughs> there, was only, there was only usual, angry was the only fly in the ointment as usual because as the, I was the chief executive at the time and on a salary and I pointed out to them that one there wouldn't be much of a role for a chief executive if we converted to a limited company and, and Paul Mendelssohn running it through code. And they, they agreed, yes, that, that's probably correct, but they had no proposal as to you know how to uh, divorce amicably. And the second thing I pointed out was the whole thing was completely unlawful. <laughs> it was, it is unlawful to set up a shell company, make yourself the directors of it, transfer all the assets of a mutual company for which you're the trustees into that shell company and not tell the members. <laughs> so, we, I obtained at great expense, I think it was 5,000 pounds or something, and at very short notice from a top London law firm an opinion that it was, what they were doing was unlawful. I think it was the day before I received the letter stating that my my uh, my signature on the GDPA checkbook was no longer valid. And um, you know the whole thing was became very acrimonious because they uh, you know despite being told it was unlawful, I don't think they're. The little 
horns on their heads got the better of them all and they tried to go ahead with it and really for Mendelssohn it was win-win because you know either he ended up in in control of the association or or he ruined it and because he'd been given control of the checkbook in effect he used the association's money to fight the association because I was fighting on behalf of the members and you know with this unlawful verdict and then and later on uh, an unlawful dismissal which I went to industrial tribunal over and won um, and and Mendelssohn was fighting all this by running down the association's bank account and the upshot of it was that it was a sort of a bit of a pyrrhic victory because we ended up retaining control of the association uh, but but it was completely bankrupt completely like busted flush um, and it was a sad time you know it was a sad part of our history and could have been the end of us with the exception of you know if it wasn't for the fact that a few members you know we were still getting members sort of contacting the old association and saying uh, you know why haven't I got my magazine <laughs> and a few of the members who were in the know said look you know this is silly you've got all these members Mandelson's walked away from them he's he's lost He's lost his battle for the association, and the association lost their uh, employment tribunal case. And um, <clears throat> and you've got all these members who are, who are sort of willing to pay, and like and want the benefits, and um, nobody's servicing them. So that's where the DFO came from, Dental Fusion Organisation, not not in any way sort of legally linked. To the other, to the old association, except in, the, in a sort of an arrangement whereby the the very few assets that still existed, because they couldn't have been sold at the time, like the membership list and stuff like that, were were sold on, um, or not sold on. I mean, they were they were given away because they were they were sort of effectively it was worth nothing. So they they were given away, and the liabilities of the association um, sort of just stood where they were you know just they weren't the DFO didn't inherit the liabilities of the DPA but it did it just inherited the few bits like the logo and that that, that hadn't been sold so the DFO was set up and set up in a completely new environment you know um, fortunately what happened was that uh, we, we were able to um, continue to collect some money because the um, Direct debit arrangement was not cancelled. Was we were still able to collect money through the direct debit arrangement, but the new website, the DFO website, was um, was was an, uh, an important advance in a way because I'll tell you uh, in a second. But what happened was uh, we were able to collect money through PayPal, um, and PayPal is extortionate. I mean, really, it's like you know, thirty percent of practically. Everything they, well, not 30%, but a large percentage of, you know, they charge a lot of money, PayPal, anyway. But having said that, I mean, it's a workable system and it's all done online and it's there 24 hours a day, etc., etc. With the, with the direct debits, um, you know, you have to, what you have to do is you have to have some software installed which communicates with them securely. And uh, last year, what happened was they decided that this software needed to be upgraded, it needed a more secure connection. And so they said, look, if you've got any software, old software, then um, it won't work. After sort of September, it won't work. So we managed to get last year's direct debits paid. But now, very definitely, our direct debits won't work this year. Um, they uh, And the reason for that is that we could get some more, we could get some more software which would enable us to do the more direct more direct debits but but having said that I mean I don't think there's much of a future in using this direct debit arrangement that the, the old uh, DPA used to have for much longer um, so we're gonna go over to PayPal I mean we can't put the direct debit through this year without getting more software and the problem with getting the software is that it cost I mean it costs many thousands of pounds and they won't sell it to you without any 
training and the training is like 200 pounds a day and you have to have like three days worth of training and it is just ridiculous it's just a, like a complete scam and this is this is to put through you know a, a, not an amazing number of direct debits on one day and that's it once one and done one once a year first of uh, June I think it is first of June they go through so <clears throat> you know that those thousands of pounds I think uh, would be wasted now that you could say well you know you know a lot of people are going to cancel their subscriptions if you don't it, direct debit the good thing about it is it's got an inertia involved in that people will you know just they're quite happy to see the money come out but if you say to them not you know you're gonna to have to do even lift a little finger to do anything differently they say well in that case I'll cancel and people do do that you know seen it before European Union of dentists actually collected all its money through standing orders and um, they didn't want to change the standing orders because they had to write to everybody unlike direct debit which you can vary at source at standing order you can't you have to write to everyone and say please can you complete another form we've put the subscriptions up and the Germans just said look you know if you write to any of the Germans and say can you put the subscriptions up they will um, they will just cancel they will say no I want to cancel it and which meant that it sort of wilted on the vine because you know the subscription went down to about 20 pounds a year and you can't do anything for 20 pounds a year and I thought, and I said to them, no, the reason why they didn't want to write to anyone, because they said these, these guys, these Germans, they've got a lot of money going through their accounts, and they will have forgotten these standing orders. They'll just be going out and they won't even know, they're, they're, they'll, they'll just pay them because they've always paid them, they won't even know what it's for. They, won't, they don't even know them, they're members of the European Union of Dentists. They probably did it in 1960-something, and, you know, and they've completely forgotten about it. And I felt that was a bit dishonest. You know, I thought, well, if you can't justify, you know, the, the few hundred quid that you charge people to support the sort of work that you're trying to carry on and your output, then, um, you know, then you shouldn't just rely on inertia selling. Inertia, inertia selling never ever kept an association going, not, not, not actively. So uh, just a heads up, and everyone will be getting an email in the couple of next couple of months, uh, weeks anyway that they are, if you pay by direct debit, then this year you won't pay. They won't be taken and your membership will run out. And if you sit in there saying, okay, that's fine, then okay, that's fine. But if you do want to do something about it, then you will get several emails with links in showing you how you can do, you can pay online. And it is actually, it's very easy. And you don't need um, a PayPal account or anything to do it you can um, you can do it by credit card and on you can pay you can pay on a one-off basis or you can do a recurring something anyway it'll all be in the email but just a quick heads up all right now we're not gonna we're not gonna go down the old play the banks game anymore it's all going online it's all going PayPal it's all going automatic so but I hope we don't lose too many members over it it would be a shame if we did but who knows? Yeah. May go back down to one. Okay, I'm at work. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.